Adjacent to the world's longest mountain range, a plane made a landing 52 years ago. What was shocking was that it collided directly with the mountain upon landing. Immediately after the crash, the 8,900 kilometers long South Island seemed to vanish into thin air. The Andes mountain range in America with its 15,000 feet high peaks is unforgiving. Many face nothing but cold and silence for days. Despite extensive search efforts, neither the wreckage nor any bodies were found, leading authorities to conclude that there were no survivors. News of the crash dominated headlines for days, causing distress. Eventually, life began to return to normal and the accident faded from memory. However, about two and a half months later, after exactly 72 days, authorities received a message from the missing plane. Flight 571, a real-life miracle in history, etched its name forever on October 12th. This flight, operated by Uruguayan Air Force, took off from the capital, Montevideo, in October 1972. It was carrying rugby players from Montevideo to Santiago, the capital of Chile, for a match. The plane had a total of 40 passengers, including five crew members, when it departed. Shortly after crossing into Argentina, the aircraft encountered sudden bad weather, forcing an emergency landing in the Argentinian city of Mendoza. The decision was made due to the formidable Andes mountain range that looms between Argentina and Chile, presenting a formidable barrier with its towering peaks. The pilot's plan was to wait out the bad weather in Mendoza overnight and then proceed the next day when conditions improved. However, little did they know what awaited them on Friday, October 13th. Flight 571 took off from Mendoza on October 13th with a route covering the remaining 180 kilometers to Santiago. However, within this short distance lay the daunting Andes, with peaks reaching up to 15,000 feet. The flight path required navigating through these towering mountains, which posed significant risks. The passengers were unaware of the impending danger as they embarked on their journey. The flight crew faced the challenge head-on, aiming to gain altitude and traverse the Andes safely on their way to Santiago. Flight 571's pilot, having completed around 50 flights, was confident as he took off from Mendoza. Following his planned route, he aimed southward, intending to gain altitude. However, as the aircraft descended, thick clouds obscured the view below, prompting the pilot to contact the control tower for guidance. With the assistance of radar communication, the control tower helped the pilot determine their location amidst the cloud cover. Despite the challenges posed by the terrain, the pilot remained calm and relied on his experience. As they approached Plain Chan Pass and the formidable Andes Mountains, the pilot steered the aircraft carefully. Navigating through the treacherous mountains, the pilot aimed towards the Chilean city of Kirkova before turning towards their final destination, Santiago. Despite the altitude and the daunting landscape, the pilot maintained control, guiding the aircraft safely through the mountainous terrain. As the journey continued, the pilot remained vigilant, constantly calculating their speed and position to ensure a smooth flight. When Flight 571 reached a critical juncture, the pilot made a decisive right turn, guiding the aircraft to an altitude of 18,000 feet above the Andes Mountains. As Flight 571 approached the Playzone Pass, the pilot relied heavily on communication with the air traffic control tower. However, as the aircraft entered the mountainous terrain, radar signals became increasingly limited and the plane disappeared from the radar of the control tower. Tragically, the co-pilot succumbed to the harsh conditions, highlighting the severity of the situation. Despite this setback, the pilot continued to navigate using other methods to determine their location. After some time, the Santiago control tower radioed the aircraft, confirming their position in Chile. With this information, the pilot requested permission to lower the altitude as they neared the city of Cuco. Typically, planes pass through Curic from Chan Pass in approximately 11 minutes. Remarkably, Flight 571 covered this distance in just three minutes, demonstrating the pilot's skill and determination in overcoming the challenges they faced. The air traffic control staff were bewildered, unable to comprehend the situation. Flight 571 was missing from their radar, causing confusion. Unbeknownst to them, the co-pilot had miscalculated the aircraft's position. Assuming they were above Carico, the pilot initiated a descent, unaware that they were actually traversing nearby, courting disaster. Meanwhile, air traffic control awaited Flight 571's response. Upon receiving clearance from the tower, the pilot veered right and reduced the aircraft's altitude, navigating through turbulent conditions. Emerging from a layer of white clouds, they were met with a daunting sight, a massive mountain loomed before them. 
Realizing they were still amidst the Andes, the pilot fought to gain altitude, but it was too late. The aircraft's tail collided with the peak, severing from the fuselage, leaving Flight 571 stranded atop the snow-covered mountain without its tail and wings. The fuselage slid down the snowy slope and came to a stop. Unfortunately, 12 passengers lost their lives in the tragic crash, especially those seated at the rear of the aircraft. Despite sustaining injuries, 33 passengers were rescued, but the severe damage caused the tail to detach. With the rear section of the plane exposed, freezing cold air rushed in. Stranded in the Andes at an altitude of 11,500 feet, we found ourselves in a place where the temperature plummeted to minus 30 degrees Celsius. Stepping outside, I was greeted by the chilling cold and the vast expanse of snow-covered terrain. The towering mountains stood before me, casting a solemn shadow over the scene. We solemnly laid our fallen comrades to rest in the snow amidst the quiet desolation of the landscape. News of the plane crash spread rapidly, prompting authorities to launch a search operation. Without delay, they mobilized four airplanes to scour the area from early morning onwards. Despite their best efforts, search teams failed to spot any signs of the plane or debris. The operation was incredibly challenging due to the mountains reflecting light off the snow, making it difficult to discern any objects. Both Uruguay and Argentina participated in the search, deploying a total of 11 aircraft throughout the day. The search teams dedicated extensive time and resources to scouring the crash site in hopes of finding survivors. Despite multiple passes over the area by rescue planes and signals emitted by the passengers, they remained unseen. It wasn't until later that a lipstick believed to have touched the plane's fuse box and a luggage bag with a large SOS sign drawn on it were discovered. Despite these discoveries, the rescue planes were still unable to locate the passengers. After days of intensive searching, the operation sadly yielded no results. Tragically, all passengers lost their lives on October 21, 1972. On the 11th day at the crash site, the passengers made a remarkable discovery, a radio in the cockpit itself. With trembling hands, they tuned in to listen to any news that could offer a glimmer of hope. However, the heartbreaking announcement that the search operation had been called off dashed their already dwindling hopes. The news hit them hard, adding another layer of despair to their already dire situation. It seemed that their last beacon of hope had been extinguished. As if fate hadn't dealt them a harsh enough blow, five more passengers succumbed to their injuries, leaving only 28 survivors on board. Amidst the wreckage and debris of the plane, they salvaged what they could. The radio was a lifeline, but its usefulness was limited. In a desperate bid to stave off the biting cold, they dismantled the cockpit's plastic casing to fashion makeshift glasses from the visor, shielding their eyes from the blinding reflections of the ice. Resourcefulness became their ally in the fight for survival. They repurposed seat covers into snowshoes and heated seat cushions into insulation against the freezing temperatures. With meager supplies, a mere eight chocolate bars, three jars of jam, some dried fruits, and scant water. Food supplies dwindled, leaving them hungry and desperate. Divvying up what little they had left was no easy task. Once the food was gone, they resorted to eating anything they could find, even scraps of clothing and cotton. This made Pur Majid sick. Stranded in the Andes with no visible way out, they faced a daunting challenge. They couldn't descend the mountain they crashed on, nor could they climb up. Their only option was to trek along the mountainside, shedding weight to improve their chances of survival. As days passed, their situation grew more dire. They struggled to comprehend their predicament as they buried their fallen comrades. Desperation set in, leading them to make the difficult decision to consume the remains of their deceased friends. After 17 grueling days, disaster struck once again when an avalanche hit their shelter, burying them in snow and ice. The survivors fought to dig themselves out, but the avalanche had damaged the fuse box, leaving them without power and oxygen. Nine of them perished in the aftermath, the remaining 19 survivors did whatever they could to stay alive, chipping away at the ice to create air pockets. Their condition deteriorated with each passing day, and their hopes of rescue dwindled as their situation grew increasingly dire. With death looming over everyone and the 60-day mark approaching after the crash, hope was dwindling. Sadly, three more souls succumbed to their fate, leaving only 16 survivors behind. Facing such grim circumstances, the remaining group had two choices, resign themselves to their fate or take a daring leap for survival. On December 12, 1972, three courageous rugby players, Parado, Canisa, and Vigen, decided to brave the treacherous journey to hike to the Western Peak. 
Their goal was to reach the other side of the mountain in hopes of finding a green valley where they might find help. However, the hike was bound to be arduous. Lacking professional gear and enduring temperatures of minus 30 degrees Celsius, the odds were stacked against them. Undeterred, they fashioned makeshift warmth from sleeping bags and ship seats, bundling up in layers of clothing for protection. Setting out on their hike, they trudged through the snow-covered terrain for three grueling days. Finally reaching the mountain summit, their hopes were dashed as they gazed upon more snow-covered peaks stretching endlessly before them. With no sign of greenery or signs of life, their quest for survival grew even more daunting. With death looming over everyone and the 60-day mark approaching after the crash, hope was dwindling. Sadly, three more souls succumbed to their fate, leaving only 16 survivors behind. Facing such grim circumstances, the remaining group had two choices, resign themselves to their fate or take a daring leap for survival. On December 12, 1972, three courageous rugby players, Parado, Canisa, and Vigen, decided to brave the treacherous journey to hike to the Western Peak. Their goal was to reach the other side of the mountain in hopes of finding a green valley where they might find help. However, the hike was bound to be arduous. Lacking professional gear and enduring temperatures of minus 30 degrees Celsius, the odds were stacked against them. Undeterred, they fashioned makeshift warmth from sleeping bags and ship seats, bundling up in layers of clothing for protection. Setting out on their hike, they trudged through the snow-covered terrain for three grueling days. Finally reaching the mountain summit, their hopes were dashed as they gazed upon more snow-covered peaks stretching endlessly before them. With no sign of greenery or signs of life, their quest for survival grew even more daunting. Interviewed in detail on December 27, 1972, which marked 72 days after the crash, three helicopters spotted Parado and Canisa. As they reached the crash site, even the pilot was amazed to see these two rugby players, without any gear, scaling the mountain. They were asked how they managed to conquer such a daunting challenge. Eventually, all the survivors were rescued and a solemn ceremony was held to lay their fallen comrades to rest. A grave was dug and their bodies were buried with a makeshift memorial constructed atop it. This memorial stands as a reminder that with unwavering courage, one can overcome even the greatest of obstacles.